I'm back. This is Keegan here. I'm making another video. I know I've been gone for a little bit. Didn't get to do my one month Pixel 4 XL review, but here I am back with a three month Pixel 4 XL review. Um, if you haven't seen the unboxing, go ahead and go to my channel, check it out, then come back and watch this. You'll be able to see my initial reaction to the phone. Spoiler alert, I actually really like the look of it. So um, I didn't do a one month review. I wanted to wait longer, actually have really good experience with this phone. I am not a full-time tech reviewer or anything like that so um, when it comes to phones i don't have multiple ones so i wanted to actually get a really good idea as to how i like this phone outside of a reviewer's mindset but more of a consumer mindset and kind of mix those together um, and then possibly have a lot of good feedback for you without any further ado let's just go ahead and get into this video so i just want to say if you don't already follow me on twitter or instagram um, it's going to be keycon93 for twitter and keycon.93 for instagram i do post sometimes pictures taken on the pixel that you can go ahead and look at okay so let's get started as far as the phone design goes now i got the oso orange thought it'd be a shame to hide it so i got this clear case on amazon it was like ten dollars um, really good case it doesn't really protect from drops or falls, but I don't really drop my phone. Uh, what I wanted to do is protect it from scratches, and when I put it face down, I didn't want it to scratch either because I don't like scratching the, the glass on the cameras. I think that'd be worse. So I also put a screen protector so I can just put it face down uh, anywhere and I don't have to be worried about the screen scratching. So as far as the phone design goes, again, I really do like the matte glass. It's really nice, no fingerprints. Um, you do get some smudges, but you can just clean those right off, but it doesn't get sticky like glossy surfaces do. One thing I've noticed is when you're like uh, playing games or watching videos, sometimes your fingers will touch the cameras. Not necessarily a big fan of that, but I don't even know how that could get fixed because uh, the camera's gonna, what, no matter where it is, it's just gonna be in the way. I don't like the pink button. I like that the volume buttons and the power button are both on the same side. I came from Samsung where they weren't. I know the new Samsungs now do that with the Bixie button on the other side, but I do like that they're both here. They're very easy to click, which is really nice. This case doesn't make it as easy to click, but that's okay. As far as the look itself, I do know a lot of times I'll be out in the streets or at my job or you know with friends and people will say, I really like that iPhone, how'd you get that color? And I'm like, no, this is not an iPhone, this is a Google Pixel. Um, and the other thing that I've noticed is actually with the look is I recognize other pixels out there just like you would with an iPhone with a triple camera system or the stovetop per se. So I get really excited when I see people that have this phone and so far I've only seen two other people that have this phone, so it's a... Uh, three amigos scenario. As far as the phone itself goes, I just want to dive into different features. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the display. The display is a 6.3 inch display. Um, I actually really like it. It's very color accurate, which is good for me. I do like taking pictures. I don't take as many as I used to with my camera. I used to take wildlife, some birds, uh, landscapes, things like that. Editing on this phone is so much different than a Samsung phone because it's more true to life. So. When I'm editing a picture, I know it's gonna look good on this phone. And then if I grab my wife's um, iPhone and look at that picture, it looks good. When I used to edit on my Samsung phone, I would post the picture and then see it on someone else's phone and be like, oh, it looks really flat. And that's just because I think my Samsung phone has so many screen options to make the screen more vivid or things like that. And I hadn't realized, but either way, it just looks more colorful, I feel like, on a Samsung phone. So this is, a little bit more flat but more true to life to where it'll look good on most devices when you post a picture. So I really like that. The chin and forehead. So as far as the forehead goes for this phone, it is kind of big. Um, I don't mind it that much and the chin as well, like it's kind of thick, but I don't mind it. I think that there's functionality similar to the excuse that the iPhone had for the notch. Um, there's that functionality of, hey, there's a sensor there, there's face unlock I was about to say face ID face unlock there there's things there that actually do add to the experience that you get with the phone um, you kind of learn to ignore it and you mainly look at this part of the phone anyway so you don't really find yourself looking at the top and saying I wish there was screen there let's just go ahead and just talk a little bit about um, battery and sound so I'll start a little bit with sound this phone is actually a joy to listen to as far as videos music on speakerphone really good one thing I don't like about the sound, and I know it's 2020, so people will say get over it, no headphone jack. 
I don't think it's so much an issue that the headphone jack's not there, is that Google didn't include an adapter, so a dongle from USB-C to 3.5 millimeter, and they didn't include headphones in the box. So I bought $30 Google headphones, and they are the worst headphones I've ever used. I'm not even like a enthusiast, so I can't say, oh yeah, I know, you know, I'm all about that sound. Um, I just think all headphones should be decent if you're buying them from a reputable company or a company that sells products like this that are premium. So that's just my thought on that. Um, but as far as the speakers though, really good. The earpiece speaker I think is one of the best on any phone that I've heard. Uh, it gets really loud even when you cover this one here, you can tell the difference. And it really gives you that stereo experience. I was worried because they took out the front speaker, but it, it, it was fine with me. So I actually really like that it still holds that quality. Some of the issues I've had have to do mostly with Bluetooth, but a lot of that has been fixed through software updates. I had a problem with Duo that it wouldn't switch to Bluetooth or sometimes there was no, no Bluetooth connected to it, but Duo would still try to play through Bluetooth so I couldn't hear people, things like that. So I had to turn my Bluetooth off. Just little inconveniences like that, those things have been fixed. I don't really have those issues anymore. Um, I really like watching videos on here with the display and the sound combo, so that's where that ties together. Display and sound, watching videos, playing games, all that of course takes a hit on battery life because your battery needs to power the screen. And that's what I want to talk about next. I know this phone got a lot of hate for bad battery life. Everything for the first month at least was just Oh, the Google Pixel gets me three hours of screen on time, two hours of screen on time. This Pixel 4 um, has horrible battery life. The, the battery life is garbage. I'm not going to be a fanboy here and say that the battery life is the best I've ever seen because that usually tends to be for me with my experience because I've used Samsung for most of my life. I've always seen that Samsung phones last longer, but I do get a solid five hours of screen on time, sometimes five and a half hours, and that is with 90 hertz forced. I forgot to say that. Um, I force 90 hertz on this phone at all times, so I think that's actually pretty good, forcing the 90 hertz and getting five hours of screen on time. It really does vary though if I watch a lot of videos or play a lot of games, which I don't tend to do. I have a desk job which I think most people, I wanna say I'm safe saying, most people work at a desk or somewhere near an outlet where if you're sitting most of the day and your phone's sitting on a desk and you know you're gonna need that battery life later, you just plug it. You leave work at 100%. It's really not an issue. I don't really have to do that. I actually leave work and it's about 60%. Waking up at 5.30, unplugging it, and then coming back home at around five o'clock if it's 60%, that's really not that bad. I don't use it that much at work, but I do use it during my lunch break, things like that. Um, or I'll get messages, you know, tweets, things like that, that I'll occasionally look at. But overall, it doesn't do that bad. I think it was exaggerated how bad it was. I don't think it's up to the standard of other companies, but it's really not bad. Another thing with battery life and screen that I actually wanted to mention is the screen brightness. So there was a lot of, again, backlash on screen brightness. The screen's not bright enough. You can't see it in daylight. I live in Florida. This is the sunshine state. I don't have a problem with it. If you're trying to watch videos, it can be a little too dark to watch videos uh, comfortably. I think that's almost any device, um, but I have no problem using it day to day. I can actually go even through Instagram and look at pictures, things like that. I don't find myself going like this and like squinting. It's plenty bright for outside, it's plenty bright for inside, it's really not that bad. Could it get brighter? Sure. I'm not saying that things couldn't get better, I'm just saying that where they're at are not as big a deal as people made them out to be. I actually have a friend that we were side by side, I was talking to him when I got this phone, it was about a month in, hey yeah, the only the only uh, bad side that I've been reading about is, you know, screen brightness is not as bright as other phones should be. He's like, I have an iPhone 11, let's compare it. We looked at it outside Florida, Sunshine State, max brightness both phones. And honestly speaking, I can't deny that there is a little bit of a difference, but it's not enough to where it actually made it enjoyable to look at anything in the sunlight. It wasn't that big of a difference. It actually looked about the same if you're just staring at it from a distance like, like what you normally look at your phone. It looked the same. The glare was the same. Everything was the same. I think the brightness is fine, that's all I'm trying to say. So as far as the things that I think don't make this phone worth the money, I think the processor, number one, the storage capacity, number two. Those really are the two big factors. I didn't think battery was a big deal, but storage, 
end processor. Why? Because the Snapdragon 855, by the time it gets put in this phone and sold, close to November of 2019, Four months away, there's a new phone coming out with the next edition of the Snapdragon processor. So Google is basically selling you almost a year old processor for the same amount of money as a phone that would come out the next year with a newer processor, faster processor. I think Google actually, the one thing, the one critique that I have for Google is they really need to just reevaluate the time when they, do, when they release a phone. They either need to release middle of the year earlier to compete with Samsung, which I don't think they're really going for that. They're probably trying to compete more with iPhone users, but I don't think that October is a good time to release a phone. That's not when any of the te new technology is announced or comes out in terms of chipsets that are going to go into a phone. They usually end up coming out late in the year to where they go into the early year phones that get sold. So old technology there, 32, uh, I'm sorry, not 32, 64 gigabytes and 128 gigabytes is pretty much a joke. It doesn't make any sense. There's no expandable storage. In fact, they should probably be 256 and 512 because there's no expandable storage. Samsung offers more memory when they could actually get away with get, giving you less because you still can put a memory card in there. So that's just something that, again, I don't think it makes it worth the money. If you can find a deal on it, um, that's great. But overall, I think those are the two things that make me say this should not be a premium phone. This phone should get knocked down a little bit. Even the Galaxy S10e came out with a 855 processor and it costs less than this phone. That's all I'm trying to say. As far as the things that make this phone really, really good, Google's known for the camera. That's obvious. Photos are amazing, okay? As far as photos go, I think portrait mode is probably my favorite. It's actually really, really good and I keep comparing it to other phones, whether it's my wife's iPhone or Samsung phones that I've had. And it's just not the same. I know Google's more exaggerated in the cutout or the shape of when they cut you out, you know, with the blur. I like the drama of it. I think it does really well with pets and objects, which I find that iPhones usually struggle with a little bit. And I might be stepping on some toes, but usually I find that the Google Pixel does better portrait mode. I don't like that it crops the picture though, because it's a digital zoom. It's not using the zoomed camera. It's actually using the regular camera and then it's cropping it for two or close to two time zoom and doing the portrait. I liked the cropped view because again, portrait photography usually means a closer, more tight type of picture, but at the same time, it should just use the two times uh, lens if it's gonna do that, not digital to where it's losing a little bit of quality. As far as the lenses in the back, I don't think it was that big a deal that there is no wide lens. And I know, again, I might get some backlash on this, but the truth is, I like to zoom more. I am a wildlife photographer. I'm not saying I'd shoot wildlife with this, but I'm a wildlife photographer. Landscape, yes, that you go wide. Wildlife, you don't really go wide, but I find actually more use in zooming into a picture from places that I can't reach, or you don't have access to step out of this, but you wanna get a picture without all the other stuff. I'd rather zoom in, get the quality, not have to crop. For the wide pictures, I actually got a moment lens. So you put this case on it, and then there's a lens that comes with it. Um, it's a super fish, yeah. And you just put it on here. I know it's an extra thing to do. There you go, you have a super fish lens. It actually gets wide pictures. And the nice thing is you're doing it with your main sensor, which means that your picture quality should technically be better uh, using this lens than using the actual wide lens from any other phone because then you're using a different sensor from your main sensor, which will probably have less quality. If I'm wrong, correct me in the comment section below, um, but that's just what I think. So I bought that moment lens, it's a great lens. As far as video goes, again, a lot of critique. I'm not a cinematographer, so I feel like 60 frames per second at 4K, to me, it's not that valuable as a everyday user. I don't flip it to 60 frames. That's also a bigger file size. I don't really do that. 30 frames is fine for me. I know it's a big deal. It's fine for me. This is just personal. I do think the front camera could have been 4K instead of 1080p though, because that doesn't make sense to me, or at least 2K or something. Like just move it up a little bit, move, bump up the specs a little bit, just to say, hey, we have what everybody else has and we have the software, which is the other thing that sells me is the software. Why? Because the software has no bloatware, smoothest Android experience I've ever had, 
I know that sometimes OnePlus comes up in this conversation, but I'm just gonna leave them aside. Same thing with software updates. I know OnePlus is very timely on software updates. Samsung doesn't tend to be, Google is. However, with the Pixel 4, that's the exception because for some reason, they're not pushing out the updates in time. I'll get the updates a few days late, which I don't like. I've actually pushed all the updates that I've had, whether it was the December security update or the January one with all the um, December one with all the updates where you could blur pictures after the fact, which is really cool because then you can take portrait mode pictures and nighttime at the same time. So you take a night shot front facing, which an iPhone can't do and then you have Google Photos blur out the background. Really cool, I found that Google Photos is not that exact though in their cropping. So anyway, that will improve over time, of course. But the software, again, no bloatware, super duper smooth. And one of the things that comes with the software is that the Google Assistant is actually built into the phone as a smaller compressed version, which makes speech recognition really good. So when you're, whether it's you're typing on the keyboard or you are using the recorder app, real-time transcribing of what you're saying. That's actually amazing. I don't use it as much as I should, but sometimes I use it in meetings. Instead of taking notes, I just record the meeting, then I look at the text really easy. I don't have to listen to the recording. I can just go over the text. Most of the time it's correct. When multiple people speak, it can get a little bit eh, and then you have to listen to that part, but it's okay. And it's searchable, so that's really good. Again, Google Assistant, as far as that goes, I really like the screen calling. Probably my favorite feature that goes unnoticed just because I don't use it. It's not something that you use per se, but you can actually set it up so new phone numbers, hidden phone numbers, or even things that Google thinks are spam can automatically be screened. And then if they're not spam because the person says, oh no, hey, blah, 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 you get a transcribed message, you say this is not spam, boom, you're done. But if it was, which most of the time it is, you don't even have to be bothered with it. Your phone doesn't even ring. I like that. As far as the software, I would also say, of course, with that Soli Radar chip at the top, and the software came Motion Sense, which is essentially waving your hand over your phone to do actions. I think that's what Google concentrates on. I don't think that's its strength. Maybe someday you could do a little uh, sprinkling of salt to turn up volume, which people seem to think would be a good idea. I don't think that's, I, I actually think that's dumb. But anyway, the point is, as far as skipping tracks like this and all that, it's cool, okay, I have used it before, whether it's in my car, although my car has like 15 buttons to script tracks, but sometimes I'll just wave my hand over it when it's in the phone holder, or at my desk at work, it'll just be sitting there, and I can just go like this, because I type and use a, a mouse, so I just wave my hand over it, and then not have to worry about it. Actually kind of makes sense, and it works most of the time. I think it works really well. But the advantage of motion sense is not in the track skipping, it's in the fact that it makes face unlock so much faster. So I actually have turned motion sense off and turned on lift to wake, and it's not the same thing. Like if you grab your phone, it's, it's unlocked as soon as it comes up to your face because as soon as you reach for it, the phone knows that you're reaching for it. It starts activating the face unlock sensors and everything. So by the time it comes up, it's already unlocked. You don't have to worry about it. So I think that's actually really powerful and I think it's underrated. Even muting up, uh, your alarm and things like that when you reach for the phone in the morning, I actually like. So personally, I think as an everyday user of this phone, those are things that go unnoticed because they're just there. They don't really take that big of a drain on battery life, at least I think. Maybe if I were to turn all that off, I'd get longer battery life, but I don't need it. So motion sense is really good. And then face unlock, I think face unlock is very good. I saw and read a lot of reviews that said that face unlock was not that reliable. It only worked like 90% of the time. It works 100% of the time for me. I do miss iris unlock, I will say that, I, or even fingerprints, like having the fingerprint sensor in the back of the phone is actually really cool because although you can turn on to swipe, you know, you can swipe down in the middle of the page, which a lot of reviewers don't say this. A lot of reviewers will be like, you have to reach all the way to the top to bring down the notification bar. No, you can swipe anywhere on the screen. You just have to turn it on anywhere on the screen. Um, but I do miss the fingerprint reader swipe down to bring down the notification bar because when you're in an app, you can't do that because you'll just scroll down in the app. So I think Google could have done something whether put the fingerprint um, sensor on the power button so you could do those gestures or up here, but they didn't. And maybe next edition they will, I don't know. We never know with Google. But I think that that is something that I do miss is the fingerprint and the iris from the Samsung phones because face unlock Sure, it works in Florida, but I am from the north, originally from Chicago. People have their face masks because it's so cold up to here and then a hat up to here. So you only see this right here, this right here. And guess what? You either have to go like this to unlock or uncover parts of your face 
or you have to take your glove off and use a touch ID or a fingerprint sensor. But when I had my Samsung phone, I could be covered up to here. It didn't matter because I was using iris a lot. So yes, it's not for everybody. It's not for everyday use. It doesn't work that great in direct sunlight because your pupils and everything. But I think it actually was pretty useful. So maybe a mix of face ID with iris unlock would be welcomed by me and fingerprint. Basically just bring it all back. As far as comparing them to a Samsung phone, since I've done that, um, there are a couple of things I don't like and I'll put a screen recording of the Samsung equivalent and then there's no native screen recorder on the Google Pixel. I though I did go on my computer and activate it through a command, but it's really laggy and bad. I might even post that just so you can see how bad it is. Google needs to do that right away and put a native screen recorder. But um, when you swipe down, first time, let me just get rid of these notifications. So first time you swipe down, there is no brightness setting. You have to swipe down twice. Not only is there no brightness setting, but as soon as you swipe down twice, the brightness setting is at the top of the screen. That makes absolutely zero sense. Why is the brightness setting all the way at the top of the screen? I just swipe down twice because I'm using it with one hand from the middle of the phone and now I have to still reach all the way to the top to change my brightness. Also, no option to have an auto brightness toggle on there. On the Samsung phone, which again, I'll show on the screen recording, you have the toggle. You can turn auto brightness on and off straight right next to the bar. That makes a lot of sense. So those are two things I don't like that I liked from a Samsung phone. Third, um, the side app tray, really useful. I actually had my most used applications there. I really loved it. I thought, no big deal, I go to Google. I like to keep my home screen uh, free of stuff. So I'll go to Google, I'll, you, I'll make folders in the app tray because I was used to that in Samsung. I go to Google, no folders in the app tray, what's going on? So only single apps, you can't put folders in the app tray. So where you, the most recent apps that you used or the suggested apps like Google go, that should be trays. You should be able to make folders on there and put, hey, this is my social media folder, this is my photography folder, this is my sports folder, this is my whatever it is you like to do. You should be able to put folders and the folders on Samsung phones appear at the very beginning of all the apps. If you have your apps appearing alphabetically, first is the folders, then it's your apps. I think that makes sense. So that does bother me. Uh, the other thing, again, has to do with the notification bar or the pull down menu with the quick options or the or the quick menu. You can long press on Wi-Fi and it'll take you to the Wi-Fi settings, that's cool. On Samsung phones, if you press on the text below it, it brings up a uh, pop-up menu. So you can interact with the Wi-Fi and with the connections without having to go to another page and then have to like switch apps and multitask to go back. You literally just click on the text and it opens a little sub menu that you can turn Wi-Fi on off or do whatever you want. Same thing with Bluetooth, same thing with everything. And then when you're done, you click out of it and you swipe up and you're out from the notification bar or you just click out of it and you're back at the app that you wanted or that you were using. So that's another thing that I think Google should implement in their software. I think Samsung does a lot of things ahead of time from Google and then Google just copies them. Same as multi-window support, which I actually love and picture in picture. I love that, so I'm glad it's here because if it wasn't, I don't know what I would do. But anyway, I think that's it. That's all I had. Um, hopefully I went through everything. Hopefully this helps. Again, I think at the price point it is now, I don't think it's worth buying, um, but I think if it were to drop in price, definitely consider it. It's the best Android experience I've had, best pictures I've ever seen in a smartphone. And I didn't even talk about night mode because I haven't used it that much. I'm waiting till Milky Way season to actually go out and take some pictures. So I'll update you on that, let you know. Overall, it's a great phone. I just don't think it's great at the price point it's at. Anyway, that is all I have to say about this phone in my experience. The new Samsung phones do come out in February, so I'll definitely come back then to go ahead and cover that a little bit. But give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, dislike if you didn't, go ahead and subscribe to my channel, and then definitely head over to the comment section below whether you liked or disliked my video, let me know why. I would like to improve my videos, I would like to do better, and if you did like things, I would like to make sure I keep doing those things. So um, any suggestions, things like that, go ahead and let me know. I'll see you next time.